Hi, Ms. Minnick here, helping my students in the Java class that I teach understand how classes work together. So we have this project called the Player Project. And related to that, at least in 2017-18 school year, we have two demo projects. In another video, we did a walkthrough explanation of the one that's called Simple Demo 1. But in this video, I'm going to try to explain the demo program called Player Project Full Demo 1. Currently, it's hosted at GitHub. Um, here it is, at least as of now, and it's got a bunch of classes that work together. So here are those classes in um, the uh, IDE JGRASP that I'm currently using. And you see the classes right here. It all kicks off from the client class called player demo and here is the main method and as we step through this we'll see that i declare and instantiate a world object we can go look at the world class to see what a world object is pretty much simply put it's one instance variable that is an array list of players. So you can kind of picture it as an array list, which I always picture as one big long rectangle, although at the beginning an array list being dynamic, it has no elements in it. But right now we're gonna pretend that it's an array list, say of size one, two, three, four, five, with of course the index positions 0 through 4 because that's how array list works. Inside of that array list, we'll have spots where we're going to be putting our player objects. And the name of the world is objects. I could have named it world, but I didn't. So keep in mind that there's going to be a player object stored in position 0 of the array list, and uh, we named this array list uh, my objects, I believe, or just objects, and I forget. And that's like a player object, and this eventually will be a player object, and that's going to be a player object, etc. And uh, more about that later. But overall, this is the world object, which is really implemented as an array list, oh, it was named objects. There was no prefix my. So just ignore that, it's a lowercase o there. Back to tracing the project. Now we'll get back to the world class later because it has some methods and, and such in it. But back to the player demo class, we now have a world. And uh, I need to control the game. And it makes sense to have a game controller or a game state, some class called game something that controls the game, kind of like a referee or um, somebody who's just keeping track that the football game is fair. And I named it game. And it's being constructed with the default constructor from the game controller class. Let's go take a brief look at it. Here's the game class, game controller class, and it has two instance variables, a instance variable that keeps track of whether it's currently running or not, and it's going to keep track of which player's turn it, it is next. And uh, that's that. Uh, maybe we'll step into it later. And now we go back to where all the main action is, and that is the client class, player demo, where we have the main method. We've now traced that down to line number 19, and I bring to a declaration an object variable named human player. I'm instantiating human player using a other constructor, as I call them, a constructor that takes three parameters in the player class. Now, one, 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 I kept it simple. 
three ones, direction, speed, and I believe position. So let's go take a look at the player class to see what human player really is. At, in this version of this demo program, a player is pretty much these, this set of characteristics or properties. In other words, this is the state of the player. A player has, well, an aliveness. He or she is either alive or not. True or false, based on dead or alive. It has a direction we'll soon see. It's either traveling east to the right, in which case we store the integer value 1 in the instance variable my direction, or we're going to use a negative 1. And it has a position on the x-axis, and it has a speed, talk about that later, and an overall number of like uh, turns that it has taken. How many times it's rolled the dice in the game, if you will. And I named that my actions, how many actions it's taken. And it also ha keeps track of, well, like a car has a mileage, uh, an odometer that keeps track of the total mileage that the car has driven. Well, a player object has a my steps instance variable that keeps track of how many steps, how many movements it's made in the, on the x-axis that I guess you can think of as the world. And it also has an internal like ID number that's unique and that is not shared with any other player object. And um, that is uh, its ID, kind of like Americans have social security numbers. Now, interestingly, we're studying now things in this class that are kind of complicated. We have a static instance variable that's not actually an instance variable because it's called static. It's sometimes called a class variable. By putting the keyword static there, this, this uh, tally number um, is shared by all player objects. So this is going to be used to make sure that all players that I instantiate have unique ID numbers and there are no conflicts, like two people with the same ID number would be bad, like two living people with the same social security number. It would mess up things, at least in the government. Okay, also in this player class, we have two constants. Again, they're static, and in this case, their final means they can't be changed. For good style, I use all uppercase letters and underscores, and um, I'm going to say that a player can only, in its lifetime, take a maximum number of at 100 steps. So as soon as it travels to the right, to the left, on the X number line, if it gets to 101, it's dead. My alive will change to false. That's the way this game works, and I'm the developer of this game, so I get to, to make the rules. It's like my own personal Minecraft. Okay, max actions. I set that at 30. That's how many actions in a lifetime, how many dice rolls, how many turns the uh, player can take in the game. So a little bit different from the max steps, but all player objects, even if they have, uh, no, ma no matter who puts them in the game, they have to live by these biological uh, rules of, well, unfortunately, death. Uh, they die after 100 steps or 30 actions, whichever comes first. Okay, the rest of this class is a bunch of constructors and modifiers and accessors and what I call interesting methods. Maybe we'll step into this later. Maybe you'll do that on your own free time and play around with it and upgrade it. Back to player demo. After declaring and instantiating a player object, well, the player object must be placed in the world. In other words, I have to put the player in position zero of my array list named objects, which is really the world. If you have a player out here and you haven't placed it into the world, is it in the game. No, it's not really in the game. It's not in the world. 
And uh, that needs to be done next. So this interesting method, which is found in the world class, because we have world dot place player. It's not game dot place player, it's world dot place player. And it sends a parameter computer player. Oh, I'm skipping down too far. We're right here right now. So human player who has a direction of one, a speed of one, and a, an initial position of one, that human player, I'm calling it, gets placed into the world. Real quickly in the world class, let's scroll down to that interesting method and the place player method uh, somewhere in this, uh, oh, oh, I went to the wrong class. No, I, no I'm, I'm in the right place. I need to find it here. Um, place player. Well, that's pretty simple. The place player method uses the add method from the array list class, which if you haven't studied it yet in this course, trust me, array lists have the ability to have something added to them because an array list starts with no size. But then like uh, spandex or something that stretches, it ends up having a size of one, which means it has an index position of zero, and then we can put a player object in there. And that's what just happened with that line of code uh, right here, objects.addPlayer. Now human player over here in player demo was passed as a parameter and it plugged in for my parameter name player. It works. I don't have to have the same name and it gets added uh, even though over here it's named human player. Well look, right here on line 23, I, after instantiating something called computer player, I sent computer player over here to this uh, world class and plugged in computer player here. So in other words, we don't use uh, like a, a, a name that, that's permanent right here as this parameter. We use something generic like player or X. And whatever actual parameter gets passed there plugs in. And at this point now we have an array list of size two with index position zero and one, and the human player is here, H, and the computer player is here. These don't really exist yet. And now we go back and we trace the rest of my client class. Oh, note that the computer faces to the west with a direction of negative one. Okay, next we are displaying the world. And the display method in the world class uses something called an array, an array of strings, not an array list, but an array. Arrays also can be visualized as basically a big long rectangle, if that's how a human wants to think of it. Now they also index, their, uh, they have a base index of zero, and then they go up and they have what's called a length and not real. They don't call it a size, they call it a length. And in this case, the name of it is strip. So uh, if you wanna like get personal here, the name of this array is strip, whereas this was called objects, and that's an array list. And what else about strip? It has a size, which that class constant is apparently 51. Now when we run this code, we will see that this strip has 51 positions. There's a zero and then 25 positive positions. And I gave it negative 25 on the negative end of the number line. So overall, it's got 51 positions. If you count the zero, it's 51 and not 50. So um, that's what strip is. And when we display the world, we are using a, the array of strings, but with a for loop, we step through objects and we accumulate using the get method from the array list class. We get 
each player, the human in this case, and the computer right here. And as we go from i equals zero and we i plus plus, we are gathering all of the um, object references that are in that array list. And one by one, we store them in next player, which is a player object variable, kind of like the batter up. It might be uh, Derek Jeter, but then when we plus plus, it might be a rod. And uh, one at a time, each player object plugs into this variable called next player. Now, if that player is alive, so if the player class gives me from this predicate method is alive, that pretty much is a, an accessor method that returns not the ID, it doesn't return the number of steps, it returns the aliveness, whether it's true or false. And if it's alive, is alive, get, got milk, is alive. If it's alive, then I add one, sorry, I lost my track. If it's alive, I add one to this uh, variable num live players. And I use that later on in my code, but I do a plus plus if that next batter up is alive. Now, if it's uh, pointed in the right direction to the east, I use an if statement to use a greater than symbol, which makes a symbol that makes it look, look to the right. Oh, there's a typo there. If it's got a direction of negative one, I point it to the left. And by using this uh, pretty shrewd size divided by two incrementation, or some, I, uh, I make it look realistic so that these uh, greater than and less than symbols are at the right spot on this long strip, this number line. You can trace the code to understand the math there, but it's pretty simple math with this if else if statement. Size divided by two. Okay, if the player is dead, in other words, if is alive is false, then I remove it from the array list. Sorry, bye-bye. And even if it's this human that's in position zero, because the way an array list works, an array list uh, shrinks or it dynamically changes and only the computer would be left, player would be left. Remember, these don't exist over here right now in this in this uh, trace. And instead of having a size of two a minute ago, we now would have a size of one. And this index position here that where the computer used to be in position one, it's now updates automatically to be considered to be in position zero. Now remember, strip is only used to show the number line to humans that need to see all of those blank spaces. But really, the array list objects is just keeping track of all the living players that are in this virtual simulation, if you will. Uh, then I clear the screen and I print the strip by using a for loop starting at i equals zero and going the whole way up to strip length. And I print the whole strip from left to right. Now, if that spot in the strip, if it doesn't have a player in it, if it's equal to what's called null, in other words, uh, well, I print a hyphen. If it's equal to an actual player, if there is a player in that spot of the strip, um, if next player is something that has a beating heart, I then plug in, you'll see either, uh, where am I? If in the strip, it's not equal to null, then I print whatever it is. And really it's a bunch of symbols. Um, 
And uh, I'm getting away with the null there, which I'm not sure if that's good style. Yeah, because strings are really references. So if it's the string that's a hyphen, it has a Unicode value that I could like do a lookup of versus a less than or a greater than symbol. But if it's uh, nothingness, then I print um, the, uh, the arrow. Well, anyway, this works even if it isn't good. I'll have to take a look at this later. But uh, it's working. And just for like beauty, just to make it look nice, I put these vertical pipes at the front and the back of the number line to show where the end of the world is in each direction. And you know that a backslash n produces a new line so that this looks as good as an RPG console output can possibly look. Okay, so we're now back to the player demo. We just did a display of the world right here, world display. I now, with the help of scanner, I allow somebody to type a command in to uh, the console window, such as move. When they hit the enter key, um, right here, actually, I'm jumping ahead. I just declare the, the scanner object there. It's only when we go through this while loop that eventually I get the next line of input. So I, I went ahead a little too far there in my uh, runtime. But in this main loop that you see that is the basis of the game, if you want to call it a game, when this loop iterates and goes around, I call up the next batter. I temporarily set that player equal to null. And if it's player one's turn, then I store human player there. And I allow the human to type something in, such as the move command that you saw me a second ago type in. And when I hit the enter key on move, next line, if the word move was found anywhere in my set of inputted letters by using the find keyword method in the parser class, which we studied something like this earlier in the school year, here's a parser class that I'm borrowing a little bit from College Board and their magpie lab. In this parser class, we have a static method. So you call the static method by typing the name of the class and then dot find keyword. And actually, because it's over uh, loaded and there are two versions of find keyword, the version down here that only has two parameters is being called. But it is then calling the version up above that has three parameters. Interesting. This method calls somebody with the same name, find keyword, and it passes three parameters there. And we've studied this elsewhere in the course, so just trust me, it works, as you see here. And when I type move, this part of the if else if else if executes because it does return a value greater than negative one. Uh, zero in the case of this because the first letter that I typed was N. Later on I'll get cute and maybe type like something if in front of the N that's like a distraction and see that it does still work. Now if it's currently player two's turn, then the computer you'll see when you trace this later generates a random number either one or two using the math.random method that we've studied elsewhere in this course. And, oh, this was just me doing a diagnosis of something that I thought was an error, so bye-bye. If the random number is a one, we tell the computer player that he has to turn. If it's a two, get it? If it's a two, we do a move. Now you can change the dice rolling, the random number uh, mechanism here and make the computer do different things and different probabilities. But basically, this is pretty boring. The computer either turns or moves, and that's that. Then we display the world again, and I toggle which player's turn it is so that the next time around the top of this loop, the other player gets to take a move. And there is a toggle player turn method in the game controller class that 
pretty simply, if it's player one's turn, we set it to two. If else, we set it to one. Now, if you had six players, I bet you would be able to figure out how to toggle and do a plus plus or something and make sure that every player gets a fair turn to do an action, whether to move. Later, you can add like a shoot method or a make a peace treaty method. You can do whatever you want in this player class and this overall project. But that's just a quick look at the game controller class where it has a method that toggles the player's turn. It would not make sense to put that method in one of the other classes, most likely. Um, overall, uh, I hope you have fun tracing this program. I took you real quickly through the client class and setting up the situation, and then a real quick iteration or two through the while loop. Now I'll close out this video by running it a couple times. So let's do a fresh clear here. Let's end the last uh, execution. And here goes. I'm going to use my uh, JGrasp IDE and run this. And uh, here it is. Currently, I am not clearing the screen out because I wanted to like kind of scroll past and so we can see it easily. So right now, I'm the human, and I think I, I'm ID number one. I'm the human. I have a location of one on my number line. I have a speed of one and a direction of one, which means I'm pointed east. My lifetime of turns or actions is zero, and the total steps I've taken is zero. Here goes. I'm going to do a move and hit the Enter key, and the, play, the computer took its turn. It looks like it did a turn. It did, no, I'm not sure what it did. It, yeah, it did a turn. So it state, uh, I'm not sure if that's working right. But anyway, let's just focus on the human. The human, me, when I typed move, the human uh, was at location one, and now the human is at location two. I'll correct, the computer player did have a location of zero, but no, I'm sorry, the, it did have a, uh, a, we'll worry about the computer later. I'm looking at the wrong numbers here. Yeah, the computer was at zero and now it's at negative one. And like I said, the human was at uh, um, location of two. Okay, I'll look into it later. Uh, this time I'm going to do a turn. Now I'm just going to do moves until I go off the number line. So there's another move. There's another move. And one more move just for fun. And let's see where I am now according to the status. As the human, I've had four actions. And I took four steps, moving one, a speed of one each time. My location is currently five. Notice that I used to be way over here, a little bit further to the left, and now I'm way over here to the right. And it does not make sense to me that the computer only had two actions. Something might not be working with the random number generator. You can trace that later. Maybe I'll fix it, maybe I won't. And uh, it's working pretty well. I'm going to do a move this time, but throw in like, hey there, and then type the command move. Oh, it still does a move because the move was found as a command because of my parser class. Um, I was at uh, the uh, X location five and I did move myself to six even though I threw in a hey there first. Um, now I'm going to check to see if the turn works. Uh, turn, I hit the enter key. What the heck? My direction was one, and it's now negative one. It worked. I didn't think it was going to work because I typed a capital T. Darn it. I didn't think this was case insensitive, but maybe it is. Uh, well, that's a bonus. And now I'm going to type exit to exit this uh, runtime, and it did exit. 
I never hit my max number of steps or turns, so I never died because I played the game too long. Uh, but that was a fun uh, runtime, even though it, there might be some bugs in it right now, especially with the computer player. I'm not sure. But have fun with this. Uh, it's available uh, on GitHub. And uh, by the time you get a look at this, it might have been updated by then. But you can always go back and possibly see some earlier uh, forks or branches, depending on how I uh, uh, use GitHub. Um, I think I just took you on a whirlwind tour through the major parts of these classes, and uh, have a great day.